Let me take you back to 2009. Barack Obama had just become president of the U.S. Kanye West's biggest public scandal was snatching the mic from Taylor Swift at the VMAs. Microsoft released Bing, which would prove largely ineffective against Google, and Google released the Chrome browser, which would prove to devour absolutely everyone else. I was the age of 11 and spending much of my time on my family's chunky CRT desktop computer, mostly on flash gaming websites of various kinds. And on April 6th of that year, something extremely interesting had just appeared on the homepage of Girls Go Games. Devilish Hairdresser. Number one on the popularity page and brand new. Who was she? And who was she? I don't care about her, I need to know more about these two! Okay, what else, what else is there? Who are these characters? What are their names? Where are they from? How did I get here? At the time, there were no answers, only this game. And as time passed, more games came out, but the answers didn't really present themselves. What was on the surface was all that there was. Devil Girl, Angel Girl, that's it. You can find some people making highly confident claims about these characters scattered throughout the web, but the fact of the matter is, all of the content that exists about them exists within the 10 Flash games released between 2009 and 2013. The most they ever got in terms of non-Flash game content were some avatars that you could use on your Girls Go Games profile. Any names other than Angel and Devil are fan creations. If any other names exist for these characters, they were never publicized or confirmed. If we're going to figure out what the deal with these characters are, we're going to need to start from the source. Who made the devilish games? It stands to reason why these games were promoted so heavily on Girls Go Games, because these characters were the creation of Spill Games, a Dutch free-to-play gaming developer and owner of GirlsGoGames.com. These games are difficult to determine the creators of, because that information is intentionally obscured by these corporations. It occurred to me after I recorded this video that if you 100% this game, you get to see the credits. However, the information that can be gathered here is incomplete. A lot of these credits are unfortunately obscured by pseudonyms. Several of the Chinese developers, like An Jia and Rico Ku, seem to be half-westernized names, and others, like Siwi, are just a nickname. However, it seems like all the European contributors get to have their full names in the credits. How funny. Kim Verbin, as the creative director, is almost certainly the one to have conceptualized these games. It's uncertain what level of direct involvement she had in these games past that point, and she stopped using the social accounts associated with her work at Spill in 2019. There isn't anything on any of her social or professional pages that indicates highly direct involvement with the creation of the Devil games. Now let's try to hunt down some real names for these other contributors. Okay, there's one other source with credits. Lu Xiao is credited as programmer, and Jia Minyan is credited as artist. Now, before I celebrate my incredible success, I have to give the caveat that this information is from Moe Girlpedia, which doesn't exactly seem like an accredited academic institution. I think I may have found a page belonging to Lu Xiao, who on the Q&A website Zihu engaged with several questions about game design, programming, and web development, which seems in line with somebody who would be programming Flash games around 2010. Although, this might just be a coincidence. I was able to find a page belonging to Jean Mignon, who also uses the nickname Anne here, but this is just an inspiration board and doesn't seem to contain any works by the artist herself. I was really hoping that I'd be able to find some other works by this creator, but this lead seems to have dried up here. And again, after I recorded the previous segment, I realized that I could probably find real names by changing the game's language in the settings. And I was right. Let's unsudo these nims. Okay, so Breath Xu, the one credited for game design, is really Xu Jianming. The artist An Jia is in fact Jia Minyan, and Siwi is Cheng Wan Xu. And the sound designer Rico Ku is Gu Chansheng. This composer actually did work for a lot of Girls Go Games creations. I wasn't able to find websites for these designers, but I'm happy that I was at least able to give them some proper credit. Alright, now let's check out this presentation from Spill. Since these are concise PowerPoint slides without notes, I have to draw some conclusions on my own, but there are a few interesting facts about Devilish Hairdresser here. First, the two concepts in regard to this game in bold are fear and control. Specifically in regards to this game, this involves taking advantage of the fear of getting a botched haircut and putting the player in control of this vulnerable situation. This slide, simply labeled Craving Crazy, I assume is about how preteen girls are completely unhinged and desire content that's as chaotic as they are. This is further expanded upon in this slide, which states that girls also find it funny to be nasty. 
This was a pretty brilliant tactic from a business perspective. In 2009, there was no shortage of mischief-oriented Flash games targeted at boys, but anything other than pretty neatness and princess sparkles were pretty unusual for girls' Flash games. In this game, you're clearly playing the role of the antagonist, and it's fun because it's a cathartic experience to intentionally wreck something and face zero consequences. This type of game, which caters to more base instincts, was a pretty unique addition to a catalog of girls' games at the time, and it's no wonder that this first installment was reported to be electrically popular, with 17 million players in the first three months from launch. Another intentional element of these games is how extremely simple the controls are. In these reaction time-based games, there are literally no other controls than left-clicking anywhere on the screen. This allows for an extremely easy-to-grasp control scheme while still allowing for some challenging gameplay. All you have to do is click, but... Damn it. You have to... God. All you have to do is... God fucking damn it. You have to make sure that Angel is looking away and stays that way. These three elements combine to make a very smart product, but where I feel like they went wrong is creating these adorable and enticing characters and then just not doing enough with them. They could have made webcomics, they could have made minisodes, they could have done in-character newsletters, anything to give these characters a bit more of a coherent narrative. I think the fact that people were already interested in making art and speculating about these characters is proof that this could have been a rich vein. If the audience is that compelled to dig deeper without even being prompted, then I think there could have been a real fandom there. So if the canon is only games, then let's dive right into all the devilish Flash games. The first iteration of these games would appear on the Girls Go Games homepage on April 6, 2009, and would set the pattern for many of these games to come. This is Devilish Hairdresser, the most quintessential and best known offering in the series. Devilish Hairdresser and the games that follow the same pattern are point and click reaction time games. You hold down the mouse when Angel is looking away and pull up as soon as you notice her start to look back. The game begins with Angel placidly trimming this young girl's hair. Inevitably, she gets distracted with a randomly generated task, which is when you take over and hold down the mouse. The longer you're able to cut without stopping, the greater your multiplier. You get a game over and go to Angel Prison if Angel catches you in the act, or if the timer runs out. If you let go just barely before the game over boundary, Angel will notice something's wrong and undo your progress more quickly. If you fill up the bar, the level is complete. Afterwards, you move on to sabotaging other clients. An issue with this game is that your success is very dependent on random variables, especially in later levels when Angel is more aggressively keeping an eye out on her surroundings. Even if you spend literally every available second of time holding down the mouse and never get the too close penalty, you may still fail the level due to running out of time. The level is only possible to win if Angel happens to be negligent enough at the time, which can feel frustrating. In this game, you'll usually fail due to your reaction time not being fast enough, but when you don't, it's not very motivating for you to keep playing. It's not a rewarding gameplay loop when technically perfect gameplay still results in failure. Next game, Devilish Pet Salon. This game was released on November 27, 2009 and is the second version of the reaction time games. In this game, the characters get a little color palette swap, but the game is fundamentally the same as the first one. It's safe to assume that, to keep the experience consistent, they use the same framework from the previous game with only minor tweaks, but they swap out the graphics for a fresh experience each time. This game plays out the same way, but with a variety of pet clients instead of people. This game seems like it may have been adjusted to be a little easier compared to Hairdresser because I'm no longer noticing the problem where you don't have enough time to complete the level. It's moderately more balanced than the first edition due to having the benefit of mass market experience. Whether you prefer to play the first or second game mostly boils down to whether you prefer the setting of a person salon or a pet salon. I'd like to take a moment to appreciate the sound design in these games. Flash creations can have some extremely rough sound effects and music, but both of those factors in this game are pleasing and complements the visuals really well. I especially like the musical motifs surrounding the angel and devil. Angel is represented by the default game music, which plays when you're not taking any action, and gets replaced by this metal guitar riff as soon as Devil starts getting into mischief. There's a couple versions of this riff that cycle out as you proceed through the levels. There's clearly a lot of consideration put into building these sounds, and the final result is something extremely high polish for a Flash creation. Next, Devilish Stylist. This one released on August 22, 2010 and is the final of the first batch of Reaction Time games, and follows the same formula as the others, except this time you're ruining the client's outfits instead of their hair. This one has an identical angel to the hairdresser game, but features one of the most unique designs of Devil. In this sprite, she swaps out her usual sleeveless dress for a bubble skirt and crop top with a heart cut out and a huge bow on the back. She also has silver drill pigtails, and most bizarrely of all, appears to be wearing a headband with fake devil horns. 
Her usual brown spiral horns are absent in this game. This is definitely the greatest deviation from any of their standard models. The gameplay is the same as the other reaction time offerings, but I particularly enjoy the visuals on this one. Honestly, the art in all of these games is pretty exceptional. The high quality artwork stands out in this game especially as the artists are able to flex their skills with designing cute outfits. This witch outfit I especially love, I would wear that in real life. I thought in this game, Devil's actions would be relatively more harmless, considering you're stuck with a terrible haircut until it's grown out or fixed, but you can just change your clothes. However, this game implies that Devil is ruining multiple weddings. Next up, Devilish Trick. The games in this series can be neatly separated into categories. The first three that we saw comprise the Reaction Time era, and the next three that we'll be seeing comprise the Holiday Spot the Difference era. This begins with Devilish Trick, released for Halloween of 2010. In these games, you're led through a series of Spot the Difference puzzles that have a few possible options per panel. These games play out a simple narrative via the puzzle images. In this first game, we're greeted with Devil hollowing out a pumpkin. Afterwards, she heads out to Angel's Hair Salon, which is apparently also named Devilish Hairdresser, despite how little sense this makes. Devil attempts to trick or treat and gets the door slammed on her. It's dubious whether this comic actually takes place on Halloween or if Devil is just being a weirdo and trick or treating on a random night. To get even for being snubbed, Devil instructs her ghost henchman to call Angel's Hair Salon and sneaks over to sabotage the client's hairstyle. The mouse indicators on the panels are shown with these dual icons, a mouse and a spyglass, which will swap sides depending on which side of the screen your actual mouse is. The feature highlighted with the spyglass will be the one that is displayed on both sides after the difference is clicked, so be mindful of that in case you're bothered by details like one of Devil's horns being missing or Angel's head wings being colored incorrectly. If you get stumped, you can click on the hint icon, which will show you an unspotted difference, but will cost you your score. Like the Reaction Time games, these manage to be fairly challenging despite the extremely simple premise. A lot of the differences are pretty obvious and easy, but some of them are very obscure and hard to catch, and the element of the differences being randomized each time means you're not guaranteed to breeze through the game even if you played it before. Next, Devilish Christmas. This was the second of three Spot the Difference games, this one released for Christmas 2010. This game controls exactly the same as the previous game, including how the side with the spyglass will stay the same and that you can spend your points to receive a hint. This game opens on Angel admiring her cozy Christmas decorations when she's interrupted by someone coming down her chimney. It's Devil wearing an extremely crude Santa costume, and Angel is delighted to see her. She offers to get her a cup of coffee, and Devil sneaks behind her back to go full Grinch and steal Angel's presents. She's not quick enough and gets busted. Now, the big question posed by this game is this. Is Angel actually dumb enough to be convinced that her friend in normal clothes, a Santa hat, and a fake mustache is actually Santa? If you apply kid game logic, this is perfectly likely. People fall for terrible disguises in kids' media all the time. However, I like to think that Angel was just really happy to see that her friend came by to visit for Christmas, but was disappointed by her Grinchly shenanigans. Next, Devilish Valentine. In our third Spot the Difference game, Angel is seen with a date with one of the most unappealing goddamn character designs I've ever seen in my life. I assume the design prompt for this character was just the word punchable. He sees Devil as she walks into her own room across the hall and is immediately smitten. He begins hitting on her, which she is visibly annoyed by. Devil, in one of her more justified acts of mischief, vows to ruin their date. Angel's baking a meal for the two of them in the kitchen, and while she's out of the room, Devil sneaks in and puts some dubious green liquid in Angel's mixture. Later on, as the two of them are enjoying their meal, the guy suddenly runs off with vomit leaking out of his mouth, confirming that Devil successfully got back at him. It is not immediately obvious whether or not he survives this encounter. Devil's actions in this game are sort of unique insofar as they're not totally opposed to Angel. It's heavily implied that Devil would have left their date alone if Mr. Wonderbread hadn't started hitting on her in the hallway. Also, um, are they roommates now? They're for sure either roommates or neighbors. That's a new development. Devil used to live in a spooky mansion. I'm personally leaning towards roommates because it seems like they have access to the same kitchen. Uh, unless Devil just broke in. That's all for the Holiday Spot the Difference era of the Devilish games. These games provide the closest thing to a storyline that we get from this game franchise. It's not a lot, but these games do offer some more concrete details about their dynamic. Angel doesn't always tolerate having Devil around like she does in the Reaction Time games. Yet, at the same time, Angel is willing to be affable and friendly with Devil when she thinks she's visiting with good intentions. These games indicate that Devil frequently goes out of her way to bother Angel, but not the other way around. Yet, at least at the point of Devilish Valentine, they're on good enough terms to be living together. Okay, let's check out the remainder of these games. Now that we've exited the Holiday Spot the Difference era, we've arrived at our third and final stretch of games, which I will call the Miscellaneous Era. 
There's not really one trait that ties all of these releases together, and they utilize a mix of concepts that are derivative from the earlier games and ones that are new to the series. This final phase began on September 2011 with the game Devilish Dress Up. This is easily the most simple game so far. It's just a doll maker using the character assets from the previous games, including Devil's different outfits and some of the dresses from the stylist game. This game doesn't have a lose state. There is something really frustrating about this doll maker, and I think it's the fact that there aren't enough facial assets that actually look like the angel and devil characters. It's especially difficult to make a devil doll that looks anything like her and isn't making a horrible grimace. And the game also doesn't bother matching the face's skin tone to devil's slightly more tan body sprites. Overall, this one is just kind of disappointing. I wish there was a better angel and devil dress-up game. Next up, Devilish Cat. We've returned to the genre of reaction time with this game, which appeared on November 27, 2011. Instead of Devil taking the helm, you play this cat, which floats aimlessly around the screen, matching the location of your mouse. The controls for this game are nearly identical to the first three reaction time games, except that in this version, little chibi angel and devils will float across the screen, dropping diamonds that you're meant to collect. You hold down the mouse when angel is looking away to vacuum all the food into your mouth. Filling the bar means the cat ate all the food available, leading to a completed level and a bewildered angel. Getting caught or running out of time results in a game over. This game seems to skew towards a younger target audience than the previous games because the challenging aspect of hairdresser, pet salon, and stylist is largely absent from this game. Angel is much more negligent and telegraphs when she's about to look at you much more slowly. I think it's worth pointing out that Angel also sends the cat to prison. The latter half of the levels you play versus Devil, which gives us the first instance of her NPC sprites. If you play the level again, you get to see Angel and Devil's recolor sprites, including this purple-haired Angel who's exclusive to this game. However, it seems like the Gold Star round, which would hypothetically have the pink-haired Angel and the silver-haired Devil, is broken on every level of the game. Next up is Devilish Cooking, the only Devilish game released in 2012, and appeared on Girls Go Games on September 16th. This is an interesting entry in the list of games because it hybridizes two types of game genres. There's a very straightforward cooking game, the type that you can't lose, and then it transitions into another reaction time game. This is the first of these games that offers Angel as a potential player character. For either character you choose, you're first led through a linear cooking game where you simply click the ingredients as they're highlighted and perform a couple gestures with a mouse to proceed. After this segment, you have a completed treat, and the game moves on to the reaction time segment. Whichever character you choose will be on the left side, and you wait until the right side character is distracted, like the previous reaction time games. So you may have noticed that until now, I had been describing these games as becoming progressively easier and easier. But that trend decidedly stops here. Devilish Cooking has even worse balance issues than Hairdresser, and after several futile attempts in a row, I thought I wasn't going to complete this game, but managed to at the literal last second. In my opinion, this plays the worst out of the Reaction Time games, because it's the only one that made me want to give up. However, I do really love that Angel is a player character. Frustratingly, the final level is locked behind a Girls Go Games login, and Girls Go Games stopped being a site you can log into years ago. It's really funny to see Angel being sneaky behind Devil's back. It's happened to her so many times by now, it's nice to see her getting even a little bit. Also, the thought of sabotaging someone's treats by making them look cute and nice is pretty funny. I also enjoy seeing Devil getting just as distracted as Angel tends to be. I feel like someone so treacherous ought to have their guard up a little more. This game mostly has really great and relaxing sound design, except for when you're dealing with wet ingredients. Those sound effects are excessively squelchy. Finally, there's Devilish Candy House. The final entry in the Devilish Game Saga was released on June 7, 2013, and is completely different from any of the other games released so far. Instead of drawing from any of the preceding game genres, it tried riffing on increasingly popular app-based games. I had never actually played this game before, so I was really looking forward to checking it out, but it seems to be broken. I can't complete the tutorial level, because no matter what I do, the game won't let me cut the string on the cookie. So I guess I'm stuck jamming with these two. Fortunately, there's some footage on YouTube of the gameplay. This appears to be a cut-the-rope style physics game where you have to deliver the cookie to Angel by manipulating the stage elements as the cookie is rolling through. For some reason, the cutting interaction just won't activate for me. It says in the description of this game that Angel has been kidnapped by Devil, which is why she's here in this candy house. However, this appears to be a pretty minimally sinister kidnapping, as Angel seems to not be in peril and is mostly just having a good time eating sweets. And that's it. All ten devilish games, and therefore all of the official information that exists about these characters. 
These are some very cute, very simple Flash games. Obviously, there's nothing that could be read into here. Just some games with appealing character designs meant to hold the attention of kids for as long as possible, and it did a great job. There's nothing else to analyze here. I think it's time to call it a night. Oh? What's that? Behind them, there. Why is that... Subtext? If I look closer, maybe I can decipher this. Ah, uh, that's it. We are now entering If You Know You Know territory. Sure, I'm betting there are some people who are really into these games who didn't interpret their dynamic as romantic at all. However, I know, I know that I am not alone that when I was a young and playing these games, I interpreted very deliberate romantic tension between these two characters. And not just because of the trope of angel and devil are dating, although it's kind of that, but because this tension is supported by the subtext of these Flash games. Let me explain. If we are to assume that these games released in order are meant to convey a somewhat linear chronological narrative, then we can begin constructing this narrative from the first released game in the series, Devilish Hairdresser. Now, you may assume that because these characters' personalities are fairly static throughout the course of these games, then that means a narrative that involves character arcs and development couldn't possibly exist. That is wrong. That is false. That is silly goose behavior. The reason this is wrong is because non-RPG Flash games are not where character development takes place. None of these games are story-driven. The gameplay is about luck and skill. And one could still argue that what I'm saying is invalid because these characters don't exist as anything other than Flash game mascots. And to you I say, It's not my fault that Spill didn't make more canon! They've only given us their subtext-laden Flash games, and this is the Wild West, baby! I can do whatever I want! Our baseline moment in this series, Devilish Hairdresser, shows us on some rocky ground between Angel and Devil already. Devil is already deeply into her gotta be a menace era and is trying to ruin Angel's work anytime her back is turned. Immediately, this poses a question. Why is Angel tolerating Devil's presence in her salon? She's standing right nearby, in her field of vision, and Angel doesn't seem to mind until she catches Devil in the act of sabotaging her work. This isn't the reaction you would have around someone you hate and distrust. Angel has her guard down, almost like she's around an old friend. And why does Devil's mischievous smirk here seem more fake and forced than this insecure and nervous body language that she has the rest of the time? The game's devilish pet salon and devilish stylist represent a bit of a problem. That being, it doesn't totally make sense to interpret these games as chronological. These issues imply that these three first games all exist in their own parallel universes in which the characters cannot interact or coexist. There's two big reasons for this, the first and most obvious being that the characters look different. Devil has a different hairstyle and color in each of these games, and Angel sports a pink look in Pet Salon. However, this doesn't disrupt the chronological theory too much because it's established in this universe, it's quick and easy to change your hair. This becomes a little more complicated when you consider that Devil is wearing a headband with fake horns in the stylist game which does seem to imply that this is a different devil from the one that we've been talking about. My explanation for this is that devils in this universe shed and regrow their horns periodically, like deer. So in this game, perhaps devil recently lost her horns, and so she's wearing the fake horns to feel less insecure. The second problem, which can't be so easily explained away, is that Angel's perception of devil is exactly the same throughout all of these games. As if each time she has zero experience with devil's treacherous behavior. This, I think, makes the parallel universe theory the obvious explanation. But I don't want obvious. I want yearning. So, the alternative explanation I propose is that these games are in fact chronological, but separated by long stretches of time. Canon is missing some necessary context, so the circumstances in which they've gained this strain on and off friendship are up to individual interpretation. What I personally believe makes sense is that these two grew up as close childhood friends. A friendship which would inevitably become tested as the two became adults and started having expectations of being a proper angel and devil put upon them. Think Fox and the Hound. Their shared personal history makes them both extremely reluctant to cut ties with one another, and a combination of their inherent natures and societal pressure causes them to be trapped in a centuries or even millennia-long cycle of reconnection, betrayal, and re-alienation, with their personal growth occurring at an agonizingly slow rate because of playing out on an immortal time frame. Honestly, you could interpret Devil's behavior here in a way that's even more grim and toxic than overt sabotage. 
Another problem that these games present with this very literal interpretation is how Angel reacts to her work being ruined. Unless she catches you, you don't get sent to Angel Prison, and she's shown to be extremely upset afterwards. Therefore, a possible interpretation of this interaction is that Devil is gaslighting Angel into believing that she's ruining her own work, which is a level of emotional manipulation that honestly isn't very fun to think about and that I will be relegating to the realm of angst fanfiction. How I actually interpret this is that Angel just has a bad case of goldfish brain. I honestly think she's just not that smart and she doesn't like to think very hard. Therefore, when she doesn't catch Devil in the act, she doesn't assume she ruined it herself, but also literally doesn't try at all to figure out who did it. She's got elevator music in her cute little head and that's all she needs in there. Therefore, she generally fails to internalize any meaningful lessons about Devil's behavior. This could be in part due to her angelic nature. Perhaps she's clueless not out of obliviousness, but out of a literal inability to conceive of an evil intention. Like it's something that she can't even imagine, it'd be like coming up with a new color. What she can clearly perceive, however, are evil acts, which always have retribution in the form of time in Angel Prison. Therefore, I attribute these slight changes in appearance over time to cyclical reconnection. Devil reaches out to Angel, they reconnect, Devil betrays Angel's trust again, and they're back to square one. It would only make sense that after an extended course of time, their personal styles would evolve. The first entry in the series of Spot the Difference games, Devilish Trick, seems to drop us into a fairly cold and strained moment in their relationship. I think it's safe to assume that this appears in the timeline directly after Devilish Hairdresser, since the plot of these images directly alludes to that game. What is notably different in this game is that Angel is no longer tolerating Devil hanging out nearby. Maybe this was after a brief stint in Angel Prison, and while Angel has infinite capacity for forgiveness, she's still putting Devil on ice for now. Devil, in her most obvious bid for attention yet, shows up specifically and only at Angel's door for trick-or-treating, and gets the door slammed on her, which triggers her toxic streak, and gets her busted yet again by Angel, setting Devil back to, like, square negative five. It's in these conflicts that I suspect the major time skips happen. Assuming these characters are immortals, there could be massive lengths of time in between their falling out and reconciliation. In order to not create massive plot holes with this reinterpretation, we have to assume that in this hypothetical world, the human world is much more stable than in reality. Hundreds or even thousands of years could pass by without severely affecting this very homogenized human culture, which will always appear vaguely modern. In Devil of Christmas, a warm and loving aspect of their friendship that we've never seen previously is revealed by Angel's reaction to seeing her tumbling down the chimney. Assuming Angel knows that Devil isn't actually Santa, and I think this is supported by the fact that she immediately offers her coffee, which seems like something you'd do for an old friend and not for seeing a magical Christmas elf, then this clearly represents a high point in their relationship. Angel is unambiguously happy to see Devil, and Devil is happy to be there, until she messes everything up again with her own greed. The game Devilish Valentine is the centerpiece of subtext for the potentially romantic dynamic between these two characters. Although it's fairly indirect, enough people interpreted this game as containing implicit romantic tension that the majority of people I asked about it agreed with my interpretation. So Angel has Mr. Least Appealing Character Design over for a meal. This confirms that Angel, at least in this point in time, is not considering Devil to be a romantic interest and is interested in men, at least enough to indulge in chaste dating. I'm going to read into this next panel a bit. Devil appears on her phone with a genuine smile and blushing. This is a really unusual expression for this character, and Devil isn't usually drawn with blush. I think at this moment it's safe to assume that Devil is talking to her own date, whose character is unseen and unconfirmed. Now, I admittedly could be reading something out of nothing here, but I feel like Devil walking by being so overtly happy to be talking to somebody else was a very deliberate decision by Devil here. She assumed that Angel would still be in the hall as she's walking by and therefore able to see how perfectly happy and satisfied she is with this new person. But this plan blew up and she got the wrong person to notice her. Devil wasn't planning to ruin their date earlier, but that's only because she couldn't justify doing so. Now she has an excuse, and a pretty decent one at that. This guy is a total scumbag. Devil convinced herself that she had to get him away from her and would do whatever she had to in order to achieve that. I assume since Angel was never depicted as being affected by the poison, Devil picked a substance that would be noxious to her human date, but that wouldn't impact immortals like themselves. He's just depicted as getting sick, but I can't shake the interpretation that she just straight up killed that man and then tried to spin it into some kind of lesson about why you shouldn't date mortals. This headcanon is for all intents and purposes a joke because I don't want to deal with how that would impact their storyline. But in all, what we see from this game is Devil acting out because of a mixture of jealousy and righteous indignation. 
Also, can we address the fact that they're now roommates? The way I interpret this is that this is a temp situation on Devil's behalf, as this place where they live seems to be heavily influenced by Angel's decorating style alone. At this point in the narrative, they are close enough friends that Angel is willing to let Devil move in with her. Which ends up being a pretty emotionally terrible situation for Devil, who is still longing for Angel, but trying to cope with the fact that she's never shown any signs of being interested in women. Therefore, she forces herself to meet new people, even though she's really not ready to move on. It's safe to assume that this living situation blew up after either Angel discovered that Devil poisoned her date, or after Devil did something else she... Because of this game, it's extremely common among the player base to interpret Devil as a lesbian due to being visibly annoyed by receiving romantic attention from a man, and Angel as bisexual but not necessarily aware of it at this point in time. Or even straight if permanent yearning is more your flavor. Ultimately, this has no bearing on canon and can be interpreted however you like. The game Devilish Cat I originally assumed had no bearing to the ship theory, but then I realized that Angel is not the only one being antagonized by this cat. There are two possible explanations to this, one which has no bearing on the ship reanalysis and one that mildly does. The first is that this is just an obnoxious feral cat which they let hang out because he's cute. The second is that Angel and Devil adopted a cat together while they were roommates. This would place this game immediately after Devilish Valentine in the timeline and would imply that they did not immediately stop being roommates after the events of that game. There is not a ton of compelling evidence either way, so it's really up to personal interpretation. Devilish Cooking represents a turning point in this series and represents one of the few clear pieces of evidence for an initiation of character development. In this game, we see the first sign of Angel's attitude towards Devil starting to change. I interpret this as Angel starting to take a less passive role in their relationship. Devil is no longer the only one making bids for attention. This may be vaguely antagonistic behavior, but more so than any of the other Reaction Time games, they seem to be just having a friendly competition instead of trying to ruin each other's day. This game shows a friendship between these two that's slowly evolving into something more stable. Nobody's really ruining anything, they're just each trying to express their own style. Although they do still go to prison when they're caught. I guess the devilish world is just a highly carceral state. The last relevant entry, Candy House, is a bit of a weird one. In this game, Devil is described as having kidnapped Angel, which is a serious offense, but it kind of just seems like she was unwillingly taken on a day trip where the objective was to compete about which one could eat the most cookies. There's not a lot of plot to this, and it's a bit of a challenge to interpret literally, but this seems to me like Devil's misguided effort at a grand romantic gesture for Angel. Instead of planning a surprise day trip like a normal person, Devil's embarrassment over her crush led her to behave in a way that's much more sinister than romantic because she can't help but sabotage herself at every turn. And again, if we are to interpret these games as semi-linear, then this interaction represents the start of a more permanent break between these two characters. Let's put a pin in that. What can be gathered by inspecting the behavior of Devil throughout these games is that she is consistently the one making these bids for attention. While I wouldn't exactly call their dynamic one-sided, without a doubt the intensity of feelings is highly imbalanced. Angel's feelings towards Devil alternate mostly between mildly affectionate and mildly disappointed. She clearly considers Devil to be an important person in her life as she lets her back in again and again despite their history. However, Angel is consistently shown to be staying in her own lane. She's never the one to reach out to Devil, although she's usually willing to be accommodating when reached out to. Devil is the epicenter of this emotional conflict, with Angel being largely oblivious to its existence. Devil is not at all equipped to deal with this. She may realize that she has a crush, but she pushes this down with several layers of resentment, competitiveness, and social obligation, so that her feelings become an obfuscated, confused mess. Because of this, she behaves extremely erratically towards Angel as she quickly switches between accepting her closeness and pushing her away. In this sense, Devil down a frenzied path of desperate attention grabs and rapidly alternating swells of affection and hatred, because no matter how much time passes, the intensity of the feelings never fade, and yet she's convinced herself that because of who she is, from Angel's perspective, she will never be good enough to be anything but an object of pity. I think no matter how you shake it, if you want to interpret these characters as romantic interests, then you need to acknowledge that Devil's behavior in these games is pretty unacceptable. She would need to do a lot of personal growth to be a decent partner. Whatever the demonic equivalent of going to therapy and making yourself meaningfully whole as a person is. Therefore, here is my proposed epilogue for these two characters. The final straw that at last broke the camel's back and made them realize that they need to stay away from each other was the Candy House kidnapping incident. 
While Angel understands that Devil was just trying to do something fun for her in her own bizarre way, I think Angel ultimately came to find that experience really unsettling. And then she did something that she'd never done before. Instead of calling Angel cops and getting her shipped off to Angel prison again, she sat down and expressed that she felt really disturbed by this violation of her boundaries and that they need to not see each other for a long time. This sent Devil into crisis mode for a while. Hearing Angel tell her that she didn't want to see her anymore, well, it kind of broke something within her. She was used to her routine, being thrown in a teddy bear dungeon for a week or two and then getting back on her usual nonsense. However, this was unprecedented. Suddenly all her mischief and pranks didn't feel so justified. And coming to terms with the fact that she had pretty much been being relentlessly cruel to the person she cared about most, well, this sends her into a depression for a few centuries, and she spends most of her time moping around her spooky mansion. Eventually, she becomes tired of this, and the inkling thought of, hey, what if you can become good enough for her, starts appearing and reappearing in her day-to-day -day life, until eventually this culminates in her finding somebody to talk to about her issues with obsession and the polarized feelings she has towards Angel. Time passes, lots of time and lots of self-reflection, and eventually Devil comes to feel like she doesn't really relate to the version of herself who would feel compelled to try to get petty revenge against Angel for not returning the intensity of her feelings. She finally feels like she's in a space where she can apologize for what she did without making things weird or worse than they were before. Angel said it would be a really, really long time before they could see each other again, and a long time it had been. And so, Devil came back again, but this time with very straightforward intentions to genuinely apologize for her past behavior and to say goodbye one final time. However, as she began to walk away, Angel stops her. Devil wasn't the only person who experienced a change in the time that they were apart. Angel had been doing some introspection herself. Even though she doesn't particularly make a habit of deep thinking, she did at least a bit in the course of the many years they were separated. As she found herself more and more focused on her work, she started to ask herself why it wasn't so exciting to go out on dates anymore. And as she failed to find satisfactory answers, her mind kept straying to her old friend, Devil. She resented all the times that Devil tried to ruin her career, but she did truly appreciate her company otherwise, and despite all that had happened, Angel can't help but think back on Devil in a positive light. And as time passed, she found herself waiting for her, feeling progressively more disappointed each passing year that Devil didn't come back and stir it up again. And maybe she had just started to assume that Devil was gone for good by the time she finally showed back up at her door. Not to mess up her life again, but to apologize and provide closure. And so, Angel asks her, Does this have to be goodbye? And after a moment of thought, no. No, it doesn't. And so, they rebuild. Time revealed to both of them the tension underpinning most of their interactions until then, and so they work together to relieve that, still taking things slow as ever. A demon of mischief is about equally equipped as an angel to handle seduction, and so they both have trouble perceiving things in any meaningful way. But they take their time, and as the millennia pass by, they prove to be utterly inseparable. Or yeah, maybe they're just good pals. But I need to level with you. That sh Boring. That's rocks in a river full of gold nuggets. Maybe we won't ever get a 60 episode animated slow burn romance, but that doesn't mean I can't spin some yarns out of these loose threads. Honestly, it's just hard for me to see the dynamic offered up by these games as anything other but a tragic innocent love story if you try to develop this beyond the absolute most meaningless and shallow that it could possibly be. It's hard to justify Devil's level of obsession with this one person if there isn't some kind of complicated romantic aspect. Probably the second most popular interpretation of these characters are that they're sisters, but I, I just don't buy this. They don't look enough alike, and they're literally two different types of fantasy creatures. I feel like angels and devils wouldn't even be biologically compatible. It's true that siblings in real life can look completely different from each other, but this is a cartoon. If they wanted to make it clear that these characters were siblings, there are a lot of ways that they could have chose to do that that they didn't. I also just find it bizarre that Devil would have this level of obsession if they had a sibling relationship. I doubt that the creators of these games intended the subtext to be included, but as the works of Butch Hartman have showed us, you don't even need to support gay people to make a compelling subtextual LGBT narrative. 
The open-ended nature of this subtext is so enticing to me because you can take the storyline in so many different directions. They can be silly and fluffy comedy characters, you can explore the angle of healing and forgiveness, you can dive headfirst into the aspect of manipulation and toxicity and interpret their relationship in a way that's completely unsalvageable, and that's what makes it so engaging. When a story is full of loose ends, you can turn those into whatever you want, even if there's not all that much to actually engage with. Thank you for putting up with me to the end of this video. I know that this is pretty different from my previous uploads, but I really hope you enjoyed it anyways. Did you play the devilish games? Did you also identify the gay subtext? Let me know with a comment. If this video inspires you to make art about these characters, please tag me on Twitter at LeeSpeaks underscore. I'm completely ravenous for more devilish content, and especially if it's of my time skip designs, I would go insane. I'm still working on that Disney Virtual Worlds video that I last mentioned, and it's shaping up to be my largest ever release. So no promises on when that's getting uploaded. Go join my Patreon if you'd like to support my channel. I just released my first Patreon exclusive video, which is a companion to this one, in which I talk about all my headcanons for these characters that pretty much have no bearing on the actual games. But if you want more devilish content, go and sign up. And on a related note, thank you so much to my first Ultra Lee VIPs, Ms. Goat and Riley Meyer. Your support makes all the difference, and I cannot thank you enough. All right.